Thanks for listening to the Get Over Yourself podcast, brought to you by Carol Fit Stationary Bike Program, 8-Minute Workouts to Get Super Fit, Perfect Keto, the cleanest, highest potency ketone supplements, MOFO, Male Optimization Formula with Organs to Boost Testosterone, Let's Get Checked, At Home Testing Kits, try LGC.com. Almost Heaven, beautiful compact home use sauna kits. Brad's Macadamia Masterpiece, the mind-blowing nut butter blend. And check out bradkerns.com slash shop, my personal selection of favorite products for health, fitness, and peak performance. And here we go with the show. One prominent study indicating that the average male testosterone level is declining at a rate of 1% per year dating back to the 1980s. Lowered growth hormone and the sex steroid hormones at sleep lead to a loss of cardiac function. This is why heart failure is strongly associated with low IGF-1 and sex steroid hormone levels. It appears that 12 to 3 a.m. are the critical hours at night are where the remnants of mammalian hibernation lie for our species. These are the anabolic times for sleep when we are rebuilding our proteins and recycling our cellular contents. We are cleaning house. Greetings and welcome to part two of our 24-hour tour around the circadian clock inspired by insights from drjackcruise.com, D-R-J-A-C-K-K-R-U-S-E. So please listen to the entertaining and informative and pretty scientific first show, and then we will get into what to do when your circadian rhythm and your lifestyle habits aren't quite dialed in, how we can make some positive changes and get all that great stuff working, your leptin sensitivity, your prolactin spike in the middle of the night that leads to all kinds of downstream benefits or causes major problems if things aren't working out for you. So quickly, quickly through the first 21 insights that we covered on the first show, 6 a.m., the cortisol spikes and you wake up. Ghrelin is also high at that time if you are metabolically healthy. 6.45, we see our blood pressure rise to get us up and ready to go perform. It's also time for heart attacks if you're unhealthy when that rise of blood pressure and cortisol occur early in the morning. Uh, then when the sun hits the retina at daybreak, uh, we have the melatonin turns off and converts into serotonin, the mood elevating hormone. And we also get that wonderful natural energizing boost from the adenosine, cortisol, and serotonin effect in conjunction with real sunlight. So getting out there in the morning, getting your eyeballs directly exposed to sunlight as well as your skin. Uh, 7.30 a.m. is insight number four. Melatonin shuts off in the brain and we're ready to go. 8.30 is when the gut wakes up. Peristalsis becomes more vigorous and bowel movements are likely. Also a good time to eat food and stimulate the gastrocolic reflex. We also have cortisol, aldosterone, and ghrelin all raised at this time along with blood pressure and that is a good time to be active, eat and digest food. We're insulin sensitive. Here we come with number six is nine to 10 a.m. These are the highest secretions of sex steroid hormones in humans, pulsatile crescendos leading to our highest alertness and receptivity to sexual activity at 10 a.m. Ha ha. Number seven, 2.30 p.m. is when our ideal muscle coordination occurs. So this window from 2.30 to 5, number 8 is that 5 p.m. is the greatest cardiovascular efficiency. So that afternoon period is the best time for exercising. It's also the best time for protein synthesis. So working out, getting a recovery meal in, that is uh, peaking in the afternoon. 6 p.m., Changes occur with the sunset. We see a major change in cardiovascular system uh, in conjunction with the sun setting. 30 minutes later, we have higher blood pressure uh, due to changes in ANF and ADH. So just uh, kind of uh, settling down and into a time period where we start to get hungry and want to slow down, eat food. So uh, that's number 11. At 7 p.m., we see a rise in body temperature 
uh, as leptin and interleukin-6 are released from our fat stores with agouti, a neuropeptide that has a signaling effect to increase appetite, decrease metabolism and energy expenditure. Time to sit around the fire, enjoy some food, and kind of recover, slow down from all the heightened hormonal and metabolic activities during the day. Number 12, for the next two to three hours, leptin levels slowly rise and insulin levels fall. Adenopinectin levels also fall during this time frame. These fat hormone signals are what activate adenosine systems in the body. Adenosine is the neurotransmitter that uh, over the course of the day rises and rises and rises and makes you feel sleepy eventually. Number 13, adenosine peaks at 10 p.m. And this... Uh, allows for the melatonin secretion, three to four hours of total darkness ideal before you can really get maximum melatonin secretion and set yourself up for a good night's sleep. Also, serum leptin is rising quickly with Agouti's help as it's released from the fat cells to enter the brain. Number 14, these trends continue. The gastrointestinal tract is slowly shut down, and by 11.30 p.m., it is adios. Bowel movements are shut down for the night. Absolutely don't want any food near the uh, late evening hours. We want to be three to four hours clear of eating uh, before it's time for bed, ideally. At midnight, leptin begins to enter the hypothalamus to bind to its receptor, and it signals energy reserve. So you're going to burn stored energy through the night. If you're metabolically healthy, that means means that you're going to be burning fat nicely throughout the night and getting rid of excess body fat uh, with uh, heat dissipation in the body. Uh, number 16, the circadian rhythm determines the ideal timing uh, of a correctly structured and restorative sleep episode. Melatonin is of great importance and that is what hits the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the hypothalamus. That's our light sensor and basically the control tower for all manner of uh, metabolic and human activity. So uh, the most important target of melatonin is the suprachiasmatic nucleus, SCN. Um, that's why we use it to uh, treat uh, jet lag. It helps blind individuals, patients with dementia, and shift workers kind of get back on schedule by uh, taking supplemental melatonin. Okay, number 17, after four hours of darkness, melatonin secretion increases and allows plasma leptin to enter the hypothalamus if we are sensitive to its receptor. If we're leptin resistant, this process can no longer occur. And that's super bad deal for restoration, fat burning, and all kinds of metabolic health, depending upon uh, that melatonin secretion being healthy and then the leptin entering the hypothalamus. Uh, so, once leptin enters and binds to its receptors, it affects the lateral hypothalamic tracts immediately and sends a second messenger signal to the thyroid to signal it to upregulate thyroid function and efficiency. This is how we raise our basal metabolic rate when we are leptin sensitive. So, we're sleeping at night and we're burning off excess body fat. Insight number 19, the timing of the leptin action is critical. It usually occurs between 12 to 3 a.m., tied to when you last ate, how much darkness your retina has seen, etc. This generally occurs soon after our hypothalamus releases another hormone called prolactin from the pituitary gland in the brain. Leptin and prolactin, key players in the story, along with melatonin and, of course, the energizing hormones that we describe in the morning, the adenosine. Uh, serotonin cortisol effect. So this number 20, the surge of prolactin is normally quite large in normal darkness, but is significantly diminished in artificially lit environments after sunset. <sighs> and when you don't get that surge, uh, you mess up your growth hormone, you mess up your DHEA levels, and you have higher levels of inflammatory markers called cytokines, uh, especially IL-6, which you might read about a lot if you're reading sciencey stuff, interleukin-6. So uh, bad sleep habits, too much light at night, uh, you miss the prolactin surge, you mess up growth hormone, mess up DHEA, mess up thyroid function, and all no bueno. Number 21, the normal large prolactin surge we should see around midnight after leptin enters the brain does not happen if the patient has leptin-resistant sleep apnea or has eaten food too close to bedtime. This is all blocked due to insulin spikes. 
This is also usually impaired if you're a postmenopausal female. That's why older women have problems with sleeping and gaining weight, surprisingly, even though they're dialed in with their exercise habits and their dietary choices. So the way to overcome or to counter this metabolic dysfunction common in postmenopausal females is to become cold adapted. Postmenopausal women who are cold adapted tend to do amazingly well clinically in most disease parameters from my experience. The main problem they face is vanity and dogma, keeping them from using the magical cold pathways to become rock stars as they age. Okay, that's the summary, and now we're teed up to continue where we left off with a wonderful part two. And what were we talking about? Oh, yeah, postmenopausal female, seeing if we can get them to jump into the chest freezer as the highest category uh, demographic to benefit tremendously from that. Exercise training tends to frustrate postmenopausal women because if their hormone response is altered, they have a lot of trouble as they age. Men, on the other hand, do not lose their growth hormone levels until 50 to 55 years old, usually. Uh, uh-oh, I guess I better get in the cold tub. Oh, I am in the cold tub. Men are also protected by their testosterone levels, which persist throughout life, provided they are not suffering from inflammation, which directly lowers their free and total testosterone levels. Growth hormone and testosterone keep a man's heart and muscles in tip-top shape. If inflammation destroys these levels earlier in life, it can show up even in younger people. I'm finding this clinical result is an epidemic in my own practice. Oh man, that's sad. And that goes with the MOFO statistics that I cite, bradkerns.com slash MOFO. Uh, check it out. Uh, one prominent study indicating that the average male testosterone level is declining at a rate of 1% per year dating back to the 1980s. That's right. Grandpa had way more testosterone than you did listening today. And that is a bad deal. It's because of a whole bunch of factors, but we're going to put the new stuff up there into focus too, which are the plastics, the environmental estrogens uh, found in plastics and, and certain bad food choices, uh, as well as the nonstop hyperconnectivity, digital technology, uh, no rest or downtime for the brain, too much artificial light and digital stimulation after dark. These are all slamming testosterone, as well as the hectic pace of high stress modern life in every way, including the workplace, including uh, interpersonal relationships. I have three shows with John Gray I'd love for you to listen to, how he talks about the uh, rapidly changing cultural roles of males and females have created a lot of uh, relationships tension that wasn't there back in the day when relationship roles were more uh, distinct and defined. So the man went out and earned the money and came home, popped open a beer, sat on the couch, the woman made dinner, and et cetera, et cetera. And now everything's uh, crossed up and it requires some adjustments and some strategies and techniques. Otherwise, you're going to trash your testosterone with uh, dysfunctional relationship dynamics that are so common today. And one way to tell if you are uh, suffering from systemic or chronic inflammation is that spare tire checkpoint because the accumulation of that special kind of fat called visceral fat around the midsection, around the organs, is an indication that your inflammation processes are messed up. And so uh, to try to get rid of that belly fat as a lifelong goal because it directly counters uh, your sex hormone levels, your testosterone and growth hormone. So looking at that spare tire, I know it's no fun. I know it's so commonplace that you got a little one at age 30 37, uh, a bigger one at age 47, and then you're full on at age 57, 67, whatever. Uh, we got to fight that battle really hard. And that's what the MOFO mission is all about. So back to this story, Dr. Cruz uh, wonderfully identifying just how important that is to uh, stay away from inflammation, from inflammatory lifestyle practices, crappy food, excess exercise, poor sleep habits, too much stress. Uh, then we can optimize those male hormone levels because we do have the potential. Listen to him. This is so important. Men do not lose their growth hormone levels until 50 to 55. Then it starts to decline. Uh, 
slowly and gradually if you're a healthy person, and they are also protected by their testosterone levels, which persist throughout life unless you become inflamed. So look at those uh, uh, flag bearers in the older age groups, guys who are still performing amazing athletic feats, looking great. Look at Sisson on his Instagram, uh, Mark Sisson Primal, flashing that six pack, no Photoshop necessary. He is in peak athletic condition. He looks just as good as he did 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And he's what, 67, 68 years old. Uh, this guy on YouTube, Charles Alley, A-L-L-I-E, running the 400 meters in the master's track and field in 60 seconds under 60 seconds at the age of 70 in the 70 to 75 age group. That's decent enough to qualify for the high school varsity team as an old man. So watch out, you young high school runners, because there's an old man out there that can give you a run for your money. Same with David Pitts, who's in my age group, 55 to 59, dropping a 54 second, 400 meters. So very healthy hormonally, doing fantastic job, preserving that male essence and competitive intensity intensity throughout life. All right. And myself, oh my gosh, with my high jumping goals and things that are continuing on into my uh, mid fifties here, I feel like I'm in better shape in so many ways on so many checkpoints than I was when I was a professional triathlete competing on the circuit uh, between the ages of 21 and 30. No, I can't keep up with my former self uh, swimming and biking and running in an endurance competition, but I can sprint just as fast, possibly faster. I can high jump better than I could when I was in high school fooling around with the high jump. And oh my gosh, it's so nice to, you know, be able to haul off a set of pull-ups that was better than I did in the junior high presidential fitness contest. And so none of this stuff is necessary to be sitting on the sideline and weeping and crying because uh, you just turned 45 or 55 or what have you. All right. That was like a commercial for MoFo. This show is brought to you by MoFo Mayo Optimization Formula with Organs. Yes, the supplementation, the diet, the whole picture, keeping active throughout the day rather than sitting around for hours at a time and all the other 10 items on the MoFo mission. And you can download an absolutely free ebook. Just click on that MoFo link at bradkerns.com, becoming a modern day MoFo and giving you the 10 assignments of the MoFo mission. It's so much fun. It's comprehensive. You're going to love it. And back to the show of the circadian clock with Dr. Jack Cruz. But we have to hit those high points when we're talking about uh, optimizing sex hormones. Super duper important. All right. Uh, He's so sad to see, Dr. Cruz is so sad to see young males coming in and having this uh, inflammation destroying their sex hormone levels and all the negative aspects of that. Uh, I was uh, citing some stats from uh, the uh, erectile dysfunction drugs are now dispensed, uh, 40% of them are dispensed to males in their 40s. So stuff that was unheard of uh, just a couple generations ago when we didn't have all these invaders. Okay, so here's a new heading for Dr. Cruz in the article to dive in. What happens when step 20, that midnight surge of prolactin, is broken in modern humans? This commonly happens in diabetics, but is now becoming a very common finding in modern humans because of the excessive use of technology after sunset. These artificial lights also tend to be quite bright and completely unyoke the normal circadian signals from the hormone response. I'm going to say yoke means synchronize in this context. We know what it's like to be yoked in the weight room. Uh, so anyway, light after sunset reduces the prolactin surge we normally see in humans. When we see chronic lowered prolactin surges, we also see lower growth hormone secretion during the anabolic phases of sleep. Lowered chronic growth hormone secretion directly affects cardiac and skeletal muscle function because the process of autophagy, that's the natural internal cellular detoxification process, autophagy, the two words mean uh, self-eating, so that means cleaning up the damaged dysfunctional cells rather than allowing them to proliferate and become precancerous and cancerous. We need to clean up shop. That's what's so great about fasting, so you've heard that term a lot probably. 
generally uh, that the benefits of being in a fasted state is you accelerate autophagy, uh, as well as uh, getting good night's sleep and cycling efficiently through all the phases of sleep and having the hormone secretions uh, be optimal. Okay, so lowered growth hormone and the sex steroid hormones at sleep lead to a loss of cardiac function. This is why heart failure is strongly associated with low IGF-1 and sex steroid hormone levels. When growth hormone is not released in normal amounts, it also decreases our lean muscle mass and increases our fat percentage in all of the organs throughout the body. This leads to slowly declining organ dysfunction and poor body composition. We can measure this process clinically by looking for falling DHEA and growth hormone and dopamine levels as we age. Now, what happens in normal aging in step 21? Aging is among the most common features found in studies on modern humans when DHEA and growth hormone craters on hormone panels. The loss of prolactin surge is especially prominent in postmenopausal women who refuse to jump into the chest freezer cold tub or take cold showers at the very least. Most women begin to suffer from falling DHEA and growth hormone levels around age 35 to 40 while they're still in perimenopause. The higher their HSCRP levels, that's high sensitivity C-reactive protein, that's a common inflammatory marker that you can get on a routine blood test or ask for it if it's not there, uh, and it indicates uh, acute inflammation. So the higher their CRP levels, the faster they enter perimenopause and the quicker they enter menopause. They also age faster on a cellular level because their circadian chemical clocks are sped up. As a consequence, their telomeres shorten faster as well. The telomeres are the uh, uh, the little shoelace extensions on the end of cells uh, that have a certain length to them that has been uh, associated now with your uh, rate of aging. So the longer the telomeres, the more chances your cells have to divide and continue to survive. And if your telomeres shorten due to adverse lifestyle practices, the cells are going to not uh, live as long. And remember cells that uh, cells in the body uh, can divide a finite number of times and then they die. And that is the uh, senescence. That's the uh, aging of cells or the death of aging cells. And that is basically aging in a nutshell in a scientific terminology. Okay. Women have higher levels of leptin for childbearing. So they are more prone to leptin resistant issues than men are. This helps explain why older women struggle with Here's some symptoms, get ready. Cognitive haze, loss of body composition, poor sleep, and increased levels of heart disease after menopause. Many physicians think that the losses they suffer are due to the loss of estrogen from ovarian failure, but the loss of growth hormone and progesterone production are far more significant in their physiology. Progesterone is the off switch for anything that's pro-growth. Modern women are usually estrogen dominant even after menopause because of mis matches in circadian biology. Cognitive loss is especially common in postmenopausal women. They also lose an average of 1% of their bone density per year from menopause, in large part due to the loss of progesterone, not estrogen. Loss of progesterone also corresponds to poor sleep in these women too. Replacing progesterone in women has a major effect on their sleep and their bone stock. It also dramatically improves their memories and cognitive function as well. Uh, I did a great show with Dr. Michael Platt. So so go listen to that one where he's also talking about the extremely important and high beneficial effects of taking a simple progesterone cream, a 5% progesterone cream. He also recommends it for men as well, uh, but this context is especially important for women. So you might want to look into that and uh, probably not ask your uh, mainstream physician because they're not in on this game. But if you can talk to a functional medicine expert or at least educate yourself, listen to the podcast with uh, Dr. Platt. He explained it very, very well. And I've been trying some progesterone cream at his behest. Uh, I can't say it's uh, been a life changer, but it's just something that I've been trying. So I'm telling you about it. And boy, oh boy, if you have those symptoms, cognitive haze, uh, you know, 
losing your previously impressive body composition quickly as a postmenopausal female, poor sleep, interrupted sleep, and increased levels of heart disease, or you have heart attack risk factors like an elevated CRP comes up on one of your blood tests, or the triglycerides uh, have gone up from uh, previous uh, baseline levels. Boy, wouldn't hurt to try it, right? So it's um, uh, Dr. Michael Platt makes his own progesterone cream. You can find it on Amazon or on his website. Okay. Replacing progesterone has a major effect on their sleep and bone stock. Hey, all right. Improving mood, memories, cognitive function. Okay, next heading in the cruise article is snacking after dinner. How does it affect your circadian cycles? Oh, it's no big deal. Keep snacking all the way through your Netflix binge. Not quite. Not. Okay. If you choose to eat within four hours of sleep, gulp, uh, raise your hand if you're not getting outside of that window. <sighs> if you choose to eat within four hours of sleep, you will never see the prolactin surge you need because any spike in insulin turns off this critical sleep time release that corresponds to the cellular maximums of the autophagic process for humans. In plain speak, I think you can pull that out there. We want that autophagy to happen in the middle of the night and insulin is going to mess that up. Uh, I'm going to editorialize and wonder if a high fat snack that doesn't spike insulin is less offensive. But we also know that the digestive system needs a break. The gut needs to uh, repopulate and nourish the uh, healthy bacteria in there. And we want that all to happen at night. So we definitely want to give our digestive system a break. Absolutely mandatory, essential to uh, consume calories within a 12-hour uh, eating window. That is the uh, the minimum expectation and probably... Uh, a very, very good health practice to try to tighten up that window into, let's say, an eight-hour window. So that would be a routine 16 hours fasted, eight hours eating window uh, for every 24-hour period. Tremendous health benefits await if you can make that happen. And uh, as Brian McAndrew, uh, my main man at Primal Blueprint, the uh, sound engineer and videographer, um, he also uh, offered a great insight whereby if you like to eat breakfast in the morning, if you're running off to a busy day where you don't have a good chance for lunch, and that's not a 16-hour fasted window, right? Because you eat dinner the previous night, have breakfast in the morning. But if you can, let's say, achieve a 10-hour fasting window during a busy active day, that's arguably just as impressive as being able to fast while you're sleeping at night because those hours are pretty much a free pass, right? The, the the eight hours that you're fasted when you're asleep, big deal. But eight hours fasted during a busy day, that's building some really good metabolic efficiency. Okay, so back to agouti, the gut hormone. This also rises in the blood to higher than normal levels to block leptin from entering the brain. So it appears, and this is one of my favorite uh, pullouts from the entire lengthy article, and I think I mentioned this in another breather show as a tidbit. Uh, Jack Cruz says, it appears that 12 to 3 a.m. are the critical hours at night are where the remnants of mammalian hibernation lie for our species. These are the anabolic times for sleep when we are rebuilding our proteins and recycling our cellular contents. We are cleaning house. They are three of the most important hours in all of human biology. If you miss them, you can bet you have several Neolithic diseases for sure. Why do you ask? If these three hours are not reached enough during our sleep cycle, autophagy is never optimized and cellular repair does not occur in our cells. This means we are using old broken down parts in our cells as the next day arrives at 6 a.m. and cortisol rises again to wake us up. We can measure this efficiency the efficiency of this process by checking DHEA and interleukin-6 levels. I also like to measure hormone panels to see if the inflammation has destroyed any other hormone cascades in aging men or women. This is vital in taking care of older people and treating their longevity. Interleukin-6 levels correspond to leptin-resistant states as well. This makes sleep and metabolic coupling tightly controlled by circadian biology at all times of our life. It is magnified because sleep gets worse as we age and our DHEA, HDL, and high-sensitivity C-reactive protein rise. 
This is where, during a biohack, we can see why circadian mismatches can cause neolithic diseases in humans. Oftentimes, we can find the same issues develop much earlier in a young paleo person who has a lot of mismatches in their circadian biology. I test them the same way I would an older person. Growth hormone is released in a pulsatile fashion from 12 to 3 a.m. during restorative sleep cycles 3 and 4, and this hormone facilitates autophagy and the recycling of proteins. In essence, growth hormone keeps us younger and in great shape when we sleep like a rock star. The problem is a modern man does not sleep well because of his brain's technology and screen creations. The next section is more about prolactin. You must be asking, why is this prolactin hormone so important in a warm, adapted human? Prolactin is not just a hormone that secretes human milk. That's the best known action of prolactin, but not the most important. Immediately after prolactin is released during sleep, another signal is sent to the anterior pituitary to release the largest amount of growth hormone as we sleep. Growth hormone is stimulated only during autophagic sleep cycles in stage three and four. I'm sure we can learn what those are on his uh, articles on his website, but we're going to assume this is the uh, deep sleep periods in the middle of the night, 12 to 3 a.m. Uh, released to increase protein synthesis for muscle growth while you're dissipating heat via the uncoupling proteins. This is where the major release of growth hormone occurs in humans post-puberty when they're warm adapted. 99% of the people reading this blog are warm adapted. If you choose to become cold adapted, the growth hormone story radically changes. Uh, Then you're going to get a bunch of those benefits we mentioned briefly and be less likely to have the Uh, the dysfunctional story that we heard when the prolactin surge doesn't occur. Okay, so the implications here are huge for the warm adapted human. If this prolactin surge is not adequate to allow us to enter the anabolic stages of sleep, prolactin surge is diminished by both artificial lights at night and by foods that stimulate MPY, namely carbs and protein, when they are eaten in the fall and the winter, when biology says they should not be available. Uh, I've heard some other people like Dr. David Perlmutter discuss this too, where he recommends eating no fruit at all in the winter because we are not adapted to consume uh, those high carbohydrate calories uh, during the winter. So if you're going to go keto or do cycles throughout the year, the winter time is a great time to, uh, for example, completely avoid carbs for a 30-day uh, restriction or experimental period. It might be a good time to experiment with a carnivore eating pattern. And so many people at meetrx.com, carnivoremd.com, those are uh, Saladino and Baker, the leaders in the movement, Uh, people are writing in showing a tremendous turnaround in chronic health conditions when they engage in a 30-day carnivore experiment. No better time to do that uh, than winter when you shouldn't be eating carbs anyway or our body's not adapted to consume carbs anyway. Okay, and uh, we're getting to the finish line, people. Pretty good stuff. If you're leptin resistant for any reason, have sleep apnea, You will always have an altered body composition because of a low growth hormone level and altered sex steroid profiles on testing. The reason is that DHEA is the immediate precursor for these sex hormones and is always low in people with bad sleep efficiency. Most very low carb eaters who are warm adapted face this very problem today. Very low carb diet is best used in a cold adapted mammal and not the modern warm adapted lifestyle. In essence, this diet is a mismatch for our modern lifestyle. This is why so many bloggers think ketosis is a dirty word for performance and body composition. Wow, trip out, people. That is a wild and radical insight, isn't it? So very low-carb lifestyle, all these benefits we've been reading and being touted are best uh, achieved or best experienced when you're cold adapted, right? When we have the uh, long, cold, dark winters of our ancestral past and those uh, periods of low or no carbohydrate intake, those went hand in hand throughout our genetic history, right? 
the carbohydrates were plentiful in the summertime and humans uh, evolved interesting ways to be able to uh, consume excess calories. Yes, we have a genetic sweet tooth and store those excess calories as fat in preparation for the long, dark, cold winters free from carbohydrate intake. Now, if we're only going halfway there, in other words, we're cutting back our carbs like a dutiful keto ancestral primal paleo enthusiast, but we're not getting cold adapted. We're staying warm adapted because we don't expose ourselves to cold and we mess up the sleep cycles with excess artificial light and digital stimulation after dark, we not only don't experience maximum benefits as touted as promised on the cover, it also could be a, a negative, a downer. Yeah. Most very low carbs who are warm adapted face this very problem. It's best used in a cold adapted mammal, not the modern warm adapted lifestyle. It's a mismatch for our modern lifestyle. This all implies that as you age, you will have a higher body fat percentage, lower muscle mass, if autophagy is not optimized by great sleep. This is precisely what we see today in most modern humans as they age. Invariably, their sleep cycles and sleep durations are poor and decreased from their childhood levels. As they age, there is a chronic insidious erosion of circadian biology by decisions made by modern humans over and over again. Whew, I'm still tripping on that final insight that uh, low-carb lifestyle is really best contemplated when you become cold adapted with uh, today, obviously, a, a devoted cold therapy practice, right? Unless you are really, really do face uh, long, dark, cold winters. So if you're above the Arctic Circle or you're up there in the high latitudes and you have an outdoor job where you're working in cold conditions all day long, uh, maybe slightly underdressed, then you're a cold adapted human. Human, but otherwise, we're going to have to hack this with a cold therapy practice. Start with that cold shower and transition, hopefully someday, to the ultimate experience of the 24-7 accessibility of home therapy that is the chest freezer. I have an entire show. You can search the archives. It came early on in the Get Over Yourself uh, podcast feed uh, about cold exposure. Or if you want to just jump to YouTube and check out that video, uh, Brad Kern's chest freezer cold therapy, this becomes more urgent than ever to uh, implement a cold therapy practice, especially if you're eating low carb. So wow, people, lots to think about here with these two episodes. And I know we kind of ended uh, on a downer with Cruz's final comments that, you know, we're going to age and get more body fat, lower muscle mass, and uh, high risk of all kinds of diseases, including cancer, because we're not sleeping well, because that light is introduced after dark. But what an easy uh, lifestyle modification to just make a resolve to have uh, quiet, dark, mellow evenings and just get that light down uh, to minimal uh, standard. You can now uh, obtain the very popular uh, tungsten light bulbs. They're kind of back in fashion, you know, the old style Thomas Edison looking light bulbs that give out an orange hue, not that bright white hue that's so offensive to uh, your your melatonin and your other hormone functions at night and just generally try to tone down the intensity of the light in your home. I just recently acquired a fantastic uh, 100 pound Himalayan salt lamp because I love the little ones so much. You know, those little guys that uh, looks like a, a rock sculpture or they sometimes design them into a, a bowl with balls in the bowl and those give off a really nice orange hue uh, emitting through the Himalayan salt and that can uh, replace the bright offensive white light bulb as well as uh, using the uh, the glasses at night, the UV protected orange or yellow lenses in the home, uh, they let in plenty of light so you can see around, uh, but they block the offensive blue light spectrum that throws off all the hormonal function. Go to my main man, Matt Maruka's website, rawoptics.com, R-A-O-P-T-I-C-S, and you can pick up some very fashionable extremely high quality pairs of blue light blocking lenses. Oh, I have a discount for my listeners. Just go to bradkearns.com and hit shop and you can click on the raw optics button there and uh, enjoy a wonderful discount. And if you don't want to invest in a, a nice pair, a fashionable pair, you can go on to Amazon and find uh, those UVEX glasses for 10 bucks. And those are really highly rated. They block out like 99% of the blue light. So get those glasses on at night, tone things down, choose mellow, 
activities like socializing, actually talking to other humans, uh, playing uh, board games, drawing, reading, instead of blasting your eyeballs with uh, screen technology and the offensive light that's emitted there. So that's the easy one to tackle here from all these Jack Cruz insights is he just wants you to get more aligned with your circadian rhythm. Thank you so much for listening to these two shows. I look forward to your comments, questions, feedback at getoveryourselfpodcast at gmail.com. And one thing I've been doing lately that's really fun is on my wonderful uh, podcast app called Overcast, you can push one button and wherever you're listening to the show, you can share that clip with someone else. Even if they don't have that particular player, it will play as a sound file if you text it over to them. So with the push of a button, you can acquaint your friends, loved ones, people you care about with a little clip from the show. I think it can go up to like one and a half or two minutes clip, and then that'll inspire them to uh, listen to the entire thing and go over and uh, check out the Get Over Yourself podcast channel. I know uh, some good things are going on because uh, we look at our stats and looking at the old shows, they continue to backfill with more listeners. So new people are finding the podcasts every day. I'm very grateful to you guys listening to spread the word and hope you continue to do so. And we'll try to put out awesome content that you uh, ask for and appreciate. So looking forward to your feedback too. All right. Da, 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 da. Thank you for listening to the show. We would love your feedback at getoveryourselfpodcast at gmail.com. And we would also love if you could leave a rating and a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. I know it's a hassle. You have to go to desktop iTunes, click on the tab that says ratings and reviews, and then click to rate the show anywhere from five to five stars. And it really helps spread the word so more people can find the show and get over themselves because they need to. Thanks for doing it.